So this is the, we're going to talk about parental alienation strategies. Now this, this is the first part of the definition we started out with where I said we have two pieces to talk about here. We have the reaction in the child and we have the behaviors of the parent, right? So these are 17 behaviors <coughs> defined by Amy Baker and Paul Fine in an article entitled Beyond the High Road. This is a great article for your clients who come in and feel like they are losing contact with their children because every strategy that they define and talk about is followed by a little blurb of advice for the parent about how to counteract what they're seeing in their child. Um, okay, so let's go through these and I'll, I'll we'll try to go through them a little bit quickly. Um, bad mouthing is probably the, the one that we talk about the most. Um, you know, I, I want to make clear that these are not boxes that are checked off ne necessarily. In the assessment process, we do look at what's been going on in these, and check off these strategies. But parents go, often go through a phase where they just don't know how to quite be divorced, despite the fact that we have tons of books out there to tell them how to behave. They, they don't really read them. And so oftentimes they uh, are just uh, a little clueless about talking on the phone with their friends and calling their soon-to-be ex-spouse some horrible name or telling a story and, and their children are outside the door with their ear up against the door listening. Those, um, you know, one, two, three, four of those that happen throughout a year is not going to result in an alienation reaction. It's not, it's not going to feel good to the child. It, it definitely has a negative reaction, but they occur, um, and they don't occur with extreme consequences. The ones that we're worried about are the ones that are repeated. There's an intensity to it. There's a frequency to it. It almost becomes a mantra where the child hears the same phrases, the same adjectives to describe their parent over and over and over again so that when I'm doing an assessment, I talk to the favored parent, and then I talk to the child who's not seeing the, another parent, I will hear the same thing come from that parent and come from the child. It's like they have been indoctrinated to repeat these phrases. So that's kind of what we're looking for in bad mouthing. Limiting contact is one where I personally feel like you must know the history of the family to know if scheduling activities is a strategy to interfere in the other parent's time. It could very well be that the child has been engaged in these activities for a very long time before the separation and divorce occurred. And therefore, scheduling those activities after the divorce, and if mom's always been the one to do that, or if dad's always been the one to take care of that and continues to do that, that is a continuation of the family's narrative. That is not a parental alienation tactic. Interfering with communication. Nowadays, this usually happens with uh, electronic communication, primarily. Um, definitely, I have seen it where phones aren't answered, phones are turned off, phones are never plugged into the charger, and the parent can never get a hold of them. But on the flip side, expects to be able to reach them anytime they want. There are definitely issues with that. Um, I've also seen this where a parent will block the other parent from the child's devices without the child knowing. And I've seen it where the child will block the parent and, and uh, the, the parent uh, who has possession of the child knows about that and does nothing about that. All of those are, um, are wrong and are interfering in the child's relationship. Interfering with symbolic communication, we usually think about symbolic communication as being pictures, right? Do one thing that's on the checklist when you go in to do a home visit. Do they have a picture of the other parent in the house at all? And I'm always surprised when I go to do a home visit, oftentimes <coughs> there will be this one very token picture placed on the bedside next to the child's bed. And that's all you see that one picture. It's almost like they read the list, right, of, of the Children's Bill of Rights and they put it there for the home visit because it's not a natural part of the community, right? Otherwise, you'd see more. You'd see pictures of the family when the family was together, if they were ever married and that sort of thing. 
You might see a photo album of a favorite trip to Cancun or something like that in the child in the child's room that has all the family in it. You see pictures of the grandparents on the other side of the family. And what I like to remind parents is that you don't all only have a, a responsibility as a divorced parent to, to keep the child's um, family memories alive through pictures in the house, but you have a responsibility to share the stories with the child, right? Children lose their memories as they get older. We all do. You know, I can't make, remember anything past eight years old. Um, but I have, I have people who tell me stories of what it was like for me to go fishing with my grandpa or to learn to drive with my uncle. Things I wouldn't remember if I didn't have my parents keeping those stories alive. Telling children stories of times that the family had a, had a good experience is another way of keeping symbolic communication alive for the, for the child. And I believe it is the responsibility of divorced parents to remind the child of the positive memories they had as a family unit. Withdrawal of love. Um, you know, this is, this is not really, this doesn't come across literal. I don't hear many children or parents tell me that they say, I don't love you anymore because you went to see your mom. It's more uh, nonverbal. It's, it's more about uh, turning your back on the child when they're telling you an interesting story about the other parent. It's looking down and keeping your head down and cooking. And then when they finish and you go, mm-hmm, that sounds nice. You know, it's that sort of thing. Um, one child I had, I, I worked with, she was so excited to see her dad after a trip with her mom and her stepdad to a, a university football game. Um, and they've been doing this for years. And so she comes out, it's dad's time, she really wants to see dad. She runs out with her Vanderbilt shirt on, she gets in the back seat of the car and got a great big smile on her face because she's happy to see daddy. And dad turns around and says, what the hell are you wearing? Um, again, another way of withdrawal of love. Doesn't even include the word love, but that is a withdrawal of love to the child. Telling the child the other parent doesn't love him or her. Um, again, rarely does this happen just that literally. He doesn't love you. Usually you hear it as, um, she, she doesn't really want to be with you this weekend. She's too busy with her boyfriend, her new boyfriend. Or um, one I had on a case last year. You can't have any new sneakers because your dad wouldn't pay for your braces and I had to pay for those and he's spending all his money on his new stepsons. You know, these are ways you tell a child in a divorce situation that the other parent doesn't love them. Forcing the child to choose can be something as direct as this. Call, call them and tell them you're not going to come this weekend. You know, could also be the um, emotional manipulation of a borderline rage anytime the parent is brought up <clears throat> could also be the emotional exaggeration of a um, histrionic parent who have you ever been in the room with somebody where where their emotions are so large it takes up the whole room to have a different emotional experience with that person is like risking your life, right? How, how dare you be say that you do not agree with their perspective of whoever it is they're talking about and whoever it is has taken advantage of them. Well, if that's hard for adults, can you imagine what that's like for kids to stand in a room where the, the parent is big to begin with, even if they're not really big, they're big in the child's mind. Their emotions are even larger and their emotions are all negative and directed at the other parent. That child, again, the transition bridge, right? I can't keep trying to figure out if my parents' reactions to, to the other parent are true or false. This is exhausting me. I'll just take on their view. They, it's so big, I can't do anything else anyway. And so again, forcing to choose could just come from emotional manipulation. <coughs> A, creating the impression that the targeted parent is dangerous. Uh, oftentimes I hear this from stories of when the child was a baby, right? 
the child can't have any memories of being a baby. But the parent thinks it's, it's in the child's best interest to tell them that mom or dad could not get up at night and feed them, that uh, they just didn't hear them wake up. And uh, so every night they needed to get up and feed that child because, bless your heart, I don't know how you would have gotten any food if I hadn't woken up to feed you, right? <laughs> Slept through the night. Uh, never put your car seat on right, right? So sending the child with all of these all of these impressions that the other parent doesn't have the capacity to make good parenting decisions to keep them safe. Talk about loading a little child with anxiety. Tell them a lot of that story, those stories, and they go over to this new house all by themselves thinking, oh no, I hope I live. I hope they hear me, I hope that they hear me cry at night as some burglar walks in the room. Okay. Combining in the child, this is, you know, sharing adult information. We see this a lot. Um, the most recent example I have is a, a dad gets served papers. He goes to the elementary school, picks up his girls, proceeds to read the papers out loud in the car with the girls there. And so, again, I think there's a me the message is, I'm the victim here somehow. <coughs> you need to feel bad for me somehow. The other parent is the aggressor and um, sending messages to the child they need to be mad at that other parent because they've hurt, they've hurt daddy or they've hurt mommy. You know, they keep taking me to court. I don't have any money to take you out this weekend because I have to pay my legal fees. Your dad's suing me again. You know, those sorts of things. Forcing the child to reject the targeted parent. Again, I think that this happens in a lot of different ways, but also um, can happen with extracurricular activities. Uh, you can keep an eye out for that, where there's a school event or an extracurricular activity, and there's a talk that's given to the child, or perhaps the child's just overhearing the, the parent kind of muttering to themselves, right? Oh, your mom's going to be there, your dad's going to be there, I really don't want to see him. Last time I saw him, he really yelled at me. Um, I don't know if this is going to turn out well. Um, or, you know, you're part of a baseball team, and your job is to focus on that team. If you see mom in the stands, it's not time to talk to mom. You know, those kind of things are what happen. Asking a child to spy, I, the, the, the main way that I say, see this now is looking through the parent's phone, looking at pictures, often has to do with a new significant other in the mix, sometimes has to do with money, you know. He didn't pay his child support last month, so you guys shouldn't be going out on seeing the movie this weekend, right? Uh, child's all loaded with guilt because they go see a movie and they go out to eat and they go for ice cream. So then it's just got to go back and it's like, well, you know, I feel really, really bad because this parent's complaining about no child support. But the, the kid's just loaded with the secret, right? I had a really good time, but I don't want to tell him. But yet he, he's, really, he's really the one being taken advantage from. Maybe mom really did the wrong thing taking us out. Again, you can see it's, it's, it's the stress that they get loaded with, right? That causes them to eventually side with one parent or another. Asking the child to keep secrets, you know, don't tell dad we're going to Mexico because he might interfere, Try won't give us the passports. Don't tell, the last, last week it was, don't tell dad we're having an airsoft birthday party because Dad doesn't like airsoft, and so he'll probably try to interfere. Well, Dad ended up being the ref at the airsoft game. So <laughs> I said to the kid in therapy, I said, now, does Dad not like airsoft? And he said, no, Dad likes airsoft. And I said, well, didn't you go to a paintball camp last summer at the Y? Yeah. Didn't Dad know you went to the paintball camp? Yeah. Well, what in the world makes you think Dad's not going to be okay with an airsoft game? He said, well... I don't know, Mom just seemed to be a little worried about it. And I said, well, I think maybe you might be um, selling Dad short. Maybe you ought to give him an opportunity to, to say yes. And so, sure enough, Dad ended up at the baseball party. I don't know how that happened, but I was sure glad it did. Um, referring to the targeted parent by first name. This usually happens when there's a, a new partner coming in the mix. Oftentimes, I'll see that as the trigger for that. Referring to a step parent as mom or dad, um, estrangement. When a parent's been gone a long time and a new parent 
has come into the mix as step parent. And the step parent and the biological parent have had another child, and there's this family unit. Oftentimes, if, if there's an absent parent, the child will naturally want to have an intact family and begin to call a step parent by mom or dad, especially if they're young. Little kids are so full of willingness to love and include that they'll do it. Does not necessarily mean there's parental alienation going on. However, it could. Again, you got to look at the whole family to see what's really going on. Withholding medical and academic or other important information. I think the saddest thing I see with this is a, a parent who goes up to the school to have lunch with the kid and they're not even listed on the forms. And they have to go through the humiliation of being told by the school personnel, um, I don't show you as mom on this form. I don't show you as dad on this form. You have to go back home, get your divorce papers, come prove to us that you are mom or dad before you can see your parent. I think that's horribly sad and humiliating. Uh, changing the child's name, again, usually happens within the context of an absent parent where the child will begin to want to use the other parent's name. And um, it uh, just causes uh, a lot of distance between them and the biological parent. Cultivating dependency is, is another word, a fancy way of saying they're enmeshed. They are codependent on each other, right? The, the child feels like if they leave, the parent's going to fall apart. Or the other way around, the child feels like if they leave the parent, they're going to fall apart because the parent's the only one who can take care of them. That parent's the only one who can attend to their needs. And so it can, it can go either way. Um, 